And um, also check out the companion series on Sapientia where we're uh, running an abridged version, sim similar conversation with a handful of other um, theologians. So Stephen, Christoph, welcome back. Um, we get to find, finish the conference off here. Um, if we want to engage uh, some of the wider conversations that have happened today and yesterday, that would be wonderful. Um, I'll step, step back for a moment, because Stephen's already self-appointed himself as the mediator of, of this discussion. So um, you had some topics that you wanted to discuss between Pannenberg and Volkinghorn, if I remember correctly. So if you want to no, get I, the conversation going, please do. I have not, I have not appointed myself <laughs> as mediator. Had I done so, I'd have sat right in the middle, believe me. Uh, no, no, no. I, I was, uh, it's simply that I adjusted what I said this morning in order to make those comments. I, I mean, I can raise a question if you want, but I've not appointed myself as mediator. <laughs> Perhaps you're taking my point too seriously. You have some ideas for discussion, if you want to get them going. I don't know what you have in mind, Jeff, but I'm happy to, to initiate, okay. if you like. Um, one thing I was interested in in relation to Pannenberg, and I think also it might be uh, allied with the question about Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, is this. One thing that's been striking to me about our conference is how little we have said, if anything, about the fall. And when I hear of Pannenberg talking about reading, you know, uh, nature and God's purposes in nature, does he think of creation dominantly in terms of God good, God's goodness? Or does he think also in terms of its fallenness so that to read it becomes something which is uh, certainly not an exercise simply in reading about goodness? And also I wondered about this in relation to miracles, whether the, the situation of Sodom and Gomorrah Etc. as a reflection of the fallenness uh, of our world. So I'm um, asking you both in that specific form about Pannenberg, but also I'm generally interested in the, in the lack of discussion of that. I mean, Kaipo would tell us here, you know, but we are, as Christians, we're supposed to think about science in terms of abnormal science, because things are not normal in the world. Always look at it as a fallen as well as a created order. Um, can I say something first in defense of Pannenberg and then come back to your question here? Um, that concerned Polkinghorn's, uh, Polkinghorn's quotation of Pannenberg of spiritualizing the field of force. That simply is um, a mistaken translation. Because the one thing that the concept of the spirit is, the spirit doesn't spiritualize. That's Pannenberg's point. If you talk about Ruach and if you talk about it in the Old Testament sense, it's not an immaterial agent, and that's the point that he makes. And that happens if you run, rely exclusively on English translations of German theologians. So that's just a mistake. <laughs> that can be very easily corrected. But, can, yeah. <laughs> there is no the, real comeback on that. It's just a mistake. <laughs> 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 it's May I turn to the substantive point? <laughs> situations I'd love to come back, but, but please go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that um, translations can be wrong. It's certainly yeah. a symptom of our fallenness. Um, now, Pannenberg has an extensive discussion of fallenness, especially in his um, anthropology, where he has, um, so to say, this uh, conversation with the empirical sciences about the dialectic between uh, the eccentricity of um, human beings, of being capable of transcending themselves um, in ever increasing ways um, so that our transcendence, um, our openness uh, to the world eventually becomes our openness to God because that's the most comprehensive uh, horizon we can uh, think of. And on the other hand, this is counteracted by the egocentricity, the self-centeredness, which is built into human beings as a possibility because they're centralized organisms, and they can turn away from this horizon. And Pannenberg solves that problem with this rather problematic move that creation is in the future. And so therefore, creation already overcomes the fallenness. That is, so to say, the conceptual move that he makes, which has a lot of problems, I think, and it might be that um, 
Colin Ganton's view of seeing a creation as a triune act um, is one way of at, at least resolving some of the tensions that are there in Pannenberg. Because I would think that Christian theology is committed to say uh, creation in the beginning is the creation of a history with a specific end. And the whole discussion we have in the history of theology, that God foreknows that end and therefore knows what he does throughout that history. That is the framework in which we have to develop the doctrine of uh, providence, which I think Pannenberg overlooks by simply placing that in the future. But it could very well be if the triune God foreknows, then the triune God is also the one who draws by the spirit, uh, which Colin Ganton uh, explains as the first fruits of future perfection, creation to that goal. And I think sin and fallenness would have to be seen as, as these kind of um, st steps backwards. Um, <clears throat> and that would, I, I think, also apply to, um, say, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. Uh, these are steps backwards in the um, destiny of humanity. And as Murray has pointed out, uh, I think, um, in, in a very clear way, um, the restoration that occurs is a restoration of God's purposes. It's a restoration of the future. It's not a restoration that brings us back to the initial state at the beginning. It's not the restoration of an original perfection. That's why Colin Ganton is so, so polemical against Augustine. If I might just add to that, having had a bit more time to think about your question um, and picking up Christoph's point there, Gundon certainly emphasises the fallenness of the created order, and it's been, as Arno has put it, uh, turned in the wrong direction, as it were. And that does require that some aspects of our created life stand under judgment. Um, well, actually, all aspects of our created life stand under judgment. And some of those disruptions must be brought to an end. Uh, they must be destroyed, as it were. Um, so some of those interventions of God, the, the order or the creation's trajectory towards its perfection necessarily involves the cessation of features in our life that have no place in that final perfection. Two, two uh, topics that came up in both of your papers, and I think might be related to this topic, um, uh, pneumatology and eschatology both figured in the doctrine of creation for Pannenberg and for Gunton. Um, so I'm interested in hearing you expand on, on the way those doctrines figure in the doctrine of creation and perhaps continuing the conversation right here, how both of those also relate to the relation between creation and redemption. Certainly, I think um, Collins... Uh, what he would say about the distinctive contribution of theology, of which there are many, but particularly in relation to science, is that th theology is able to speak of the telos of creation in a way that science, in its own terms, cannot. There's often talk about science not being able to speak of the purpose uh, of things. It can speak of the mechanisms and so on, and the causal relations, but not of the telos. Um, so theology certainly brings that to the conversation between theology and science, there is an end in view. There is an eschatology, and the Spirit's work is critical in bringing that end to fulfillment, as is also the work of Christ uh, in, in that drama. Um, so without that, um, all human activity actually is kind of lost, <laughs> floating on an ocean with no direction. Um, and so the eschatology that Colin brings, the sense of a telos of creation, gives us a criteria against which to assess all our human activity. Does it conform or not with that eschatological purpose that God is bringing about? Um, yeah. I think one could add um, two points there, uh, which are, I think, um, very specifically part of um, Colin Ganton's theology. Um, the one is, um, that um, the spirit um, is seen by him very much as a personal agent. And so that's the influence of Eastern Orthodox theology at the time of um, when John Zizulas were there and John Collin and I were to some, uh, together, so to say, the core of the research seminar in systematic theology there. The spirit is a personal agent. 
And therefore, the spirit is not to be connected primarily to the inwardness and the, the diffusion of everything, as Pannenberg does it. Um, but the freedom of the spirit is the freedom for persons given by a person. This is a very important element there. It's not an apersonal spiritual influence or something like that. And the next um, step is that he emphasizes as much as, um, I know no other theologian in the Western tradition that does it in that way, the transcendence um, of the spirit. Um, so um, the spirit, the Lord, was one paper that he gave as the congregational lecture in London during my time there, in which the transcendence of the spirit is emphasized in order to, to counteract tendencies also in Reformation theology of seeing the spirit simply working within us being the kind of princi principle of interiority. Now, both these emphases you need in order to restore the eschatological role of the spirit. So the spirit must be the spirit of freedom, a person that is transcendent, and not some kind of diffusive power or field of force or something um, like that. Um, I think Polkinghorn is, is right in criticizing this aspect uh, of Pannenberg. Um, but um, the way what Pannenbergs, I think, tries to emphasize is something that you also find in Polkinghorn, for example, in this um, recent book that he edited, The Entangled Universe. Field of force means an order of relationality. That's basically it. And the order of uh, relationality constitutes discrete entities. So if you talk about causal relations, then you have to talk about the whole order of relationality. And this order of relationality works with the top-down causality. Uh, that's Polkinghorne's idea, the, the idea of the bottom-up thinker. I mean, this is significant that he does that. And he uses for that, especially in the Zygon article, which is the only one where he expands that more fully, um, the idea of information. And um, information is, in a way, one would have to say, and not always causal, but all causal relations um, contain information. And therefore, information is more than causal, but never less than causal. And the element I want to add to that by going to the category of communication instead of information, uh, to make it quite clear that it's not just a kind of informational content that is transmitted through the laws of nature, but this has also an element of actuosity, of do that, do that now. So it's not just... Um, um, and therefore, I prefer to speak of a divine speech act in that, because there you have, so to say, um, the different dimension, of the locution and the illocutionary load of the speech act, but also the perlocution, uh, what does it do? And that is exactly what we need, and therefore this kind of conceptuality might be able to, in a way, to mediate the gap between divine discourse and divine action. So that's the whole idea. I think Polkinghorne wants very much the same thing, but he's a little more cautious than I am with, re with regard to the category of information. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, to, to, yes, I would. Um, three observations, uh, if I may. Uh, one, just very quickly on the initial point about translation. Um, this occurred to me... This occurred to me I knew I, that he would ah, want ah, to come back. No, this, is, this is something I should have done. I should have stood up and gone like that. Because in the quotation where he says, spiritualize, it in inverted commas. And what, what Polkinghorne actually wants to say is that uh, Pannenberg underestimates the continuity, the form of materiality being talked about in field theory from that which is talked about pre-Einstein. That's, I think, the main point he wants to make. But, but point generally, very, very much taken. Uh, the second observation I want to make is that the reason, in response to someone's question, uh, I said that on information and causality, he might be open to talk about communication, is that one critic of Polkinghorne, well, commentator of Polkinghorne says, that when you look carefully what Polkinghorne says about informational causality, you ask yourself, is this really causality? Is he not talking about something like context? And it occurred to me reading that, that he, as a matter of fact, yes, that the, the category of causality is not sacrosanct in Polkinghorne. So I do think he could be moved in mm -hmm. this direction in principle. Mm -hmm. The third observation, if I may, which takes you back to the original question on the spirit and uh, eschatology, and forgive me if this is a slight tangent, but 
I warm very much to, I warm to both Colin Gunter and Pannenberg in many ways. But Colin here in particular, uh, I warm to, uh, he was a, a personal friend. Uh, I think he, his emphasis on the eschaton is extremely important. I think one thing that has held that up has been the English translation of the Hebrew in Genesis 1. The, the translation, the word good. Uh, I'm not saying the word good should not be used in translation, Hebrew scholars can correct me, but it just has been taken to mean by generations of people, perfect, fine, flawless. Uh, whereas actually, it's, it seems to me, scholars correct me, it's something more like uh, adaptable for purpose, fit for purpose, which once you begin to read it like that, gives you the eschatological opening all the way from Genesis, as a matter of fact. But that will mean fit for God's purpose. I mean, what's Absolutely. always overlooked is that, yeah. um, and he saw that it was good and then very good, that is God's judgment oh, upon yes. his creation. Yes. So it's not talking about some kind of inherent attributes that creation might have, but it therefore means good for his purpose. Well, although I think we've got to be careful about saying that there might be a difference between an inherent attribute and the way God regards it. That's an antithesis, we should, a distinction we should explore, I think. But, but I actually I had in mind good for God's purposes. Uh, that, that's certainly what I had in mind. What I was getting at there was the tendency of uh, much of the, tr of the tradition and much popular Christianity for people to think of the creation having been perfect in the sense of complete and flawless, nothing else to be done, then the fall comes and destroys it. Hmm. Uh, and that Genesis uh, really uh, suggests an eschatological opening, but I did have divine purpose in mind, certainly. Hmm. Any questions? We have uh, one down here. Um, so since we're uh, a big theme among uh, your three presentations was eschatology, um, and eschatology of creation, I was wondering if, um, given that mankind is both a uh, creature and image of God, image of the divine. If there's a, if you see in uh, the theologies you guys are uh, presenting any specific way in which the eschatology, or the eschatological end of mankind is distinct from um, or unique within the eschatology of all creation um, in Gunton, Pannenberg, and Lincolnhorn. In terms of Colin Gunton's approach, certainly um, humanity is not to be distinguished from the creation as uh, something set apart from it that has, is to be set up in God's eschatological purposes while the creation is left behind. Um, that's a deep problem for, for Colin. Rather, the whole creation is enabled to become what it is intended to be. But within that, we can differ differentiate a, a particular and special role for humanity. Uh, the image of God gets at that. Um, Colin picks up here, again, with the orthodox uh, influence through John Zazulis that Christoph has mentioned, this idea of humanity uh, as priest of creation. Humanity has a particular role in gathering creation into the praise of its creator. Um, humanity is the unique creature amongst all create creatures who can respond in prayer and, and enter into an intentional communion with God in that way. And, and, but humanity cannot leave the rest of creation behind in that. Uh, it has a responsibility to the rest of creation to, to priest, in a priestly way, gather it in to that communion with the Father. Now, of course, there's also, it's also necessary to say, as I briefly mentioned, that we have failed uh, in that role and Christ enacts it on our behalf, but in such a way that we are unable to participate in that reality once more. <coughs> Polkinghorn also thinks that you've got to think through the uh, eschatological destiny of humankind and creation together. Um, in fact, he's deeply sympathetic to Maltman here when Maltman accuses uh, the tradition sometimes of having thought too anthropocentrically and not sufficiently cosmocentrically <coughs> and not sufficiently in terms of the destiny of God, the Sabbath rest as being the eschatological end of things. Poking on is sympathetic um, to Maltman there and he, would, he certainly 
thinks through the eschatological destiny of humankind and creation in, in similar conceptual categories, as a matter of fact. So in that respect, broad similarity, I think. I would see more of a difference here because um, Pannenberg and Moltmann uh, and Moltmann's influence, you also have to s some extent um, in Polkinghorn, um, belong to that generation in European continental uh, theology, which had the kind of motto, last things first. Eschatology comes first, and that really unravels everything that we have. Moltmann's um, um, theology of hope, Pannenberg's early program, mm -hmm. all that worked in that particular direction. And I think um, both Colin Gunton and um, John Polkinghorne belong to a different age of theologizing, where the um, theology of creation suddenly um, has far more attention. Um, in Colin Gunton, um, I think the important thing is that he makes it foundational for the whole enterprise of culture uh, in his Bampton lectures. That was at that stage uh, quite unusual for a Protestant theologian who would be focused on the fall and redemption and not on the doctrine of creation. So that was a very interesting move. I was with uh, John Polkinghorne, a member of this um, research group that looked at um, the ends of the world, no, the ends of God and the end of the world. And there the question yeah. was be very much, um, what should we, we be looking of uh, if we talk about the role of humanity? Polkinghorne would, by subscribing to the anthropic principle, say, um, well, there is a special role for humans in that they can also reflect about the end of the universe. And they're the ones who are able to connect reflection on the ends of God and the end of the universe, however jarring the, the, the contrast might be. And in this working group where we had scientists presenting all kinds of cosmologies there, the questions were, what are the elements in our present experience, our experience of the world, our experience as sciences, scientists, our experiences um, in the church that help us to reconcile the ends of God and the end of the world. And I would, um, well, that's the point I argued in that volume, would say, yes, we have such ante anticipatory uh, experiences. And the most important for me um, is the Eucharist because that shows quite clearly that here we have a point in our present day experience where I'm being told um, your, your past is not your future and you're not defined by your past. But since you are forgiven, the possibilities of God for your life from now on are much wider than the antecedents conditions of what I've done in the past uh, would determine them to be. And this is the kind of um, mediation and also, I think, negotiation of the different concepts which would help us to see how a, a kind of open eschatology is made determinate. And that seems to me to be the, um, the, the theological task, that it's not just the future. It must be a determinate future. And this future is determinate by God's purposes. But God's purposes are also there for us in our present experience in the church and the way in which we look at the world. They're not disconnected from that. No, but, but I think key phrases they've used are anticipated in the church and the way we look at the world, not anticipated in the world itself. I mean, pulling on, of course, that, that consultation you were part of, I'd, I'd forgotten you were part of that, by the way, he distilled his own, you know, that's... Yeah, my contribution was insignificant, you see. All oh, right, I see, I see. Um, I mean, I, I'm aware of that, uh, that, uh, that uh, volume and talking about his own single volume afterwards on the God of Hope. But what talking about the same relation, response to you would be, oh, yes, uh, there's an anticipation of the life of the church, but that is not an anticipation that scientists are able to tell you about. You don't look at the cosmos and see any anticipation of this. This is the big mistake made by Bayard de Chardin, um, who actually tries, from looking at the cosmos, to glean something of an optimistic possibility. That, says Polking Hall, you can't do. But yes, in the church, uh, you can have that kind of hope. In the following book, I think he agrees with the point I made in the consultation and quotes that extensively um, by saying, in the church, you have that experience. And yeah. what follows from that now is how should scientists who are also in the church look at the world. Ah, yes. And how should people who are members of 
a church and have that kind of experiences and also live in the world that the sciences analyze now try to reconcile those. I'm, I'm a bit yeah. unhappy with uh, poking on at some times uh, saying here theology says more than the, th the sciences uh, um, can possibly say and um, uh, theology says the better things. Well, that's nice, but nevertheless, it, it leaves the, the task of mediating the two in some way. So Schleiermacher's eternal covenant, alliance, and so on, uh, is something that is implied in the Christian doctrine of creation. Uh, we cannot rest assured that in the church we're being told how things really are and let the sciences do what they want. That would make God into the tribal God of some kind of church Christianity. I must let Murray come in here, but if I can respond very quickly to that, this, this is a, a fruitful disagreement for us, I think. Um, <clears throat> a broad brush disconnect between what we hold in the church and what can be said by scientists about the world, I agree with you. But personally, I should be quite untroubled by a situation where scientists all say, when we look at the world in terms of what we can see in front of us and uh, the prognosis looking at the cosmic processes, we see no hope. I have no embarrassment about saying to Christian, no, you may see no hope, but actually I've got a hope for you. I do not have to detect in the cosmic process. I don't have a Christian to look to see there must be something there, visible, uh, which is going to uh, sort of convince the scientist that maybe there's a little bit of hope which we can uh, pinpoint by extrapolating it from what we see right now in the cosmos. I, would you be troubled by that? Would you be troubled by a theologian saying, I don't care what you see there. God himself will do things on this particular point. I would say that um, as a Christian, I'm committed to care about what my neighbor sees there. Yeah. And I would um, therefore also say, and look here, the Christian story contains that because there will be no kingdom of God without God's judgment. Everything will come to an end. And there has to be an end to the way things go in creation in order to be perfected. So that's um, basically Polkinghorne's point about the new creation from the old creation. So it's from the wreckage, the garbage of what our world of history, we can believe that. And possibly the cost cosmos scient scientists predict that will become that God's communion with this reconciled creation is there. And I think this point about judgment is extremely important because otherwise you would, um, so to say, turn uh, the, the, the Christian hope in, into something that is entirely just an optimistic vision, whereas the signs have negative visions. Come to us, uh, we s still th see things in a more positive light. It's but, not like that. But my proclamation that there is life beyond death, that Jesus was raised from the dead, and that's a sign of that, that is not weakened for me by the fact that a scientist might say, I can see no evidence in the world around me that people come back from the dead. I see none of that. I would still want to say, well, even so. Uh, even though you can't, looking at the world around you, see evidence that anyone will come back from the dead, nevertheless, uh, I believe that Jesus... Uh, yes, but see, the question is, how would you see the world if you say, this is what I confess? that Jesus was raised from the, dead, uh, from the dead, and that is the ground of hope that we have. How would you see the world in conversation with the scientists? Uh, and therefore, I think one would have to say, we cannot let whatever the scientists say about the future of the world um, stand by itself, but must get in some sort of discussion there. Uh, by the way, there's one exception to what you've just said. Um, which is very interesting for Panberg. Panberg's idea were taken up by the cosmologist yeah, yes, Tipler yeah, yeah. and yeah. the physics of immortality yes. show yes. you that there are examples in science where they become, in my view, over-optimistic yeah, yeah. in what to expect there. But wouldn't it be a question that we as Christians cannot, um, so to say, um, leave the matter there uh, where we say, uh, well, um, whatever you see as the negative outcome doesn't concern me. It must concern us because we have to show that there is some truth that is relevant for the sciences in our hope for resurrection and the last judgment and so on. Don't we? I, I'd love to respond, but I must make good my promise to let uh, Do you have, do you have anything you want to say? I would just say one thing, I think. That it has to do with the hermeneutical key. Uh, 
to uh, the interpretation of what is seen, I think. Um, the world treated in itself has evidence on both sides, I think, for the restoration of life and for the dissolution of life. Taken on itself, we can't draw any particular conclusion, I think, about the ultimate purpose of things. In the light of Christ, though, and especially in the light of his resurrection, we might see in the world signs, such as John points us to, of God's activity, God's restoring um, the, his purpose of things. Now, science might give us insight into the wonders of some of that, I think, but absent the hermeneutical key of Christ raised from the dead, we're at a loss to how to interpret them. It seems that the conference ends with as many questions as answers. Um, Tom will come up to, to give the final words in a second, but please join me in thanking these uh, three